Today we have um, an increasingly important topic, and so I would like to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, who probably does not need an introduction um, uh, that is, as he is well known to all of you, I suspect. Um, Carlos, however, is a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease. He is the Hubert uh, Professor and Chair of the Department of Global Health at the Rollins School of Public Health, and he is the Interim Executive Associate Dean down at Grady. He is a nationally known, internationally known HIV researcher, but we asked him here today because he is also a nationally known tweeter and um, I think leverages social media about as well as anybody I've ever met. And so Carlos is going to introduce us to what I have, have come to realize is an increasingly important world that I have begrudgingly been dragged into, which is the world of social media as an academic physician. Carlos. Okay, well, thank you, Wendy, and uh, I hope the other sides can hear uh, the talk. So as, as, as Wendy said, I'm going to be talking to you about social media and what it matters to us as academic physicians. These are my disclosures. And uh, so we'll define what social media is and talk about the various platforms. We describe the use of the various uses of social media in medicine and in science, and then understand specifically a little more about Twitter and how why it's an important as an academic physician. And uh, so we'll do some uh, Poll Everywhere questions. If you don't have the Poll Everywhere app, you'll have to uh, just text uh, uh, 22333 to Carlos Del Rio 576, and then you'll connect. And uh, again, uh, this is all open, so please, pictures and sharing in social media are encouraged throughout the talk. Uh, so the first question that I have for you is, do you use social media professionally? And the answers there are yes, no, I, I just haven't figured out how to sign up, or no, I have no interest. So please go ahead and, and vote. Okay, so we have a job to do here because <laughs> the um, we got about a 50-50 split between those that use it actually going down now. Uh, but obviously, we'll have a job to do because obviously people have figured out, but they have no interest, and and that's what I'm here to try to convince you that you need to have interest. The second question I have is if you use social media professionally, which is your favorite platform? And these are by all means not all the platforms available, but professionally, not not for talking to your friends. Is it Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, YouTube, and there are Pinecrest, and there are many others you can put up there. Well, at least the ones that are using and are using Twitter, which is the one we're going to talk about professionally. Uh, the department also has, by the way, a Facebook and an Instagram account, so you guys need to be aware of that. <clears throat> so what is social media? Social media is the collective online communication channels that are dedicated to community-based input, uh, interaction, content sharing, and collaboration. And there are several uh, platforms. There are many platforms. Uh, I just post a couple of them that are the most familiar with, which are Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And basically what they are, you know, Facebook is very popular, a uh, social uh, media network. It's, it really is used to upload. I mean, everybody has used it for photos, for videos, for messaging, for uh, keeping up with friends and family. I can tell you the story of my daughter being in, in high school and letting me know, uh, Dad, if, if you get on Facebook, it's going to be really creepy. Please don't do it. And then... Uh, and then years later, when she was uh, out of college, she says to me, how come you're not on Facebook? How, could, how am I supposed to keep up with you? And I was like, OK, you know, let's once sometimes you want it, sometimes you don't. Um, uh, Instagram is, again, a, a, a platform, uh, a photo sharing platform. And uh, it's increasingly being used. Again, young people will tell you Facebook is for old people. A lot of young people are really now on, on, on Instagram, and that's how they're sharing information. Uh, <laughs> LinkedIn is a social networking site designed specifically for the business community. It, is, it allows people to, to establish a, a trust and professional communications. And fi finally, Twitter is a free microblog service that allows uh, members to broadcast short messages and follow others doing the same. <clears throat> so social media in the US has grown significantly. And you can see from this data the number of people that have, are now on social media. And, and Twitter now has you know, close to over 300 million users. And 75% of advocacy organizations use Twitter. And that's an important piece of information for you. It's a major role of, of Twitter and of social media is advocacy. And we'll talk a little more about that. 
I'm sure each and every one of your professional societies, whether it's the American College of Physicians, American College of Chest Physicians, American College of Cardiology, IDSA, they're all on social media. They are actively using this in their advocacy. So what do we know about physicians and social media? Well, this survey shows that about 50% of physicians are on Facebook. Uh, about 50% of physicians are on social, uh, have a Facebook account. 21% have a Twitter account. But 30% say they don't have any social media presence at all. And I'm going to try to change that, at least around here, and make it a little less than 30% by telling you why you need to be on social media. <clears throat> so why social media? Well, you know, if you think about the world population, about 7.5 billion people, you know, now there's about 3.8 billion people who are on the Internet. Active social media users is close to 3 billion people. In other words, almost 40% of the world population. And mobile device users are about 5 billion people. In fact, there is now more people who have mobile devices than have toilets in the world. And active uh, social media users on, on mobile devices is about 2.6 billion people. So about 36% of the world population is actually doing social media on a mobile device. <clears throat> so why social media? Well, because you can tap into audiences previously untapped because you can create opportunities for education where there was none, and because you can become a thought leader and people will then listen to you, follow your advice, and, and, and create change, and you become an influencer. As you know, this is how politics is, is happening today. Whether we like it or not, I think President Trump has showed us that social media is how he advances his agenda. Social media is how he fires people. Social media is the way he communicates. So, it is the best and easiest way to reach members of Congress. Every single member of Congress has one or more social media platforms, and they hear you. They, they listen to you when you tap them on social media. So this is really an incredible advocacy tool that has exponentially increased our ability to really reach uh, our, our leaders in a way that we weren't able before. Before, you had to call them or you had to travel to DC and meet with them. Now you can really engage them very rapidly through social media. And, and advocacy organizations know this very, very well. <clears throat> Social media is an incredible education uh, uh, resource. And in fact, in medical education, there's a growing community of people using social media as a way to communicate. Because you, know, you can follow, you can influence, you can educate, whether you're a clinician or a researcher. You can share your advice. You can share your communication. I can tell you that you know, when you're in the middle of an emergency, whether it's Ebola, Zika, a lot of information is going through social media. And then one thing that you can also do is you can amplify the context of scientific meetings and, and, and reach uh, populations that are not there. So if somebody doesn't go to a meeting, they can actually be at the meeting by doing social media. So you, you can share content, you can expand your professional network, you, you can uh, see what's trending, and then you build relationships, you build networks this way. <clears throat> For those of us involved in research, social media is increasingly important. This is nowadays how you tell people about your research. This is how people look at your research. And your research will be looked a lot more if your papers are promoted in social media. And in fact, a lot of journals are doing this. They have now active social media channel for many of the nerd work, net, uh, journals. And this is how they're promoting their papers, whether you're talking about New England Journal of Medicine, Annals, JAMA. This is how they are getting their message out. And altmetric scores have become increasingly important. <clears throat> so this is how we think about in the past, this is the biometric scores in the past. You know, we talked, we looked about citations, we looked about H index, we looked at different metrics of the impact of our research. Well, a new metric you need to be aware of is altmetric. And altmetric is it's a way to look at the impact that your research is having in social media and in media in general. You can see the news channels that have covered, the blogs that have written about it, the Twitters that have occurred about it, etc. And in fact, it is really an important way to get your research because the, the combination is not one or the other. It's really the combination of, of both conventional metrics and alternative metrics that synergistically promote your research and get really, will probably accelerate the translation from research into clinical care. And all physicians should receive training in bibliometrics and understand the potential impact of professional social media use. I think we all need to know if you're doing research, you need to understand how social media is used to promote your research. Why is this important in academic medicine? Well, because there's really good data now that actually many places are now using social media scholarship and alternative metrics in academic promotion and tenure. And if you want to see how to do this more, I mean, there's clearly this article, but you can also look uh, uh, 
Jared Gardner, who's a pathologist who actually trained here in soft tissue tumors and now it's in Arkansas, has this great video that I would recommend you look at about how he put together his promotion package and how he used social media and how he put social media into his promotion package. And it was a very useful thing to do as he was going up for promotion. So as we look at our you know, promotion guidelines here in the school, maybe time to incorporate social media into what we're doing. And again, for women in medicine, this is a particularly useful channel. I recommend you look at this paper by Julie Silver and others looking at social media for the advancement of women physicians. It is really an incredible way for women physicians to express their opinions, their insights, their visions about their specialty. It's really a platform that is non-traditional but far-reaching for dissemination of research, for speaking invitations, for career-enhancing opportunities. It's a way for women to promote themselves and to get promoted in ways that in the past simply did not exist. <clears throat> and I would recommend, you know, Julie Silver, some, somebody who's very, very active, and she's put together this campaign called Be Ethical as an example. And this is really something that has taken off as a way to promote a gender, you know, and gender workforce disparities and an ethical, as an ethical imperative. And this whole campaign is really taken off because of social media. And she's, uh, you know, ensuring that organizations, including, for example, meetings, sign up to this. So, you know, you don't have a panel of only men at a meeting, but you have a gender representation at meetings. And Julie has really been the force behind it. And social media has been the way that this has been promoted. So you can help others in your field. You, you can talk about teaching opportunities. You build your network. You build your reputation. And yes, you get invited to, to speak at conferences because your research will become available and your research will be noticed, but you also get invited to give a talk about social media. Okay, let's talk about blogs. Blogs are a short uh, for web blogs, and they're a sort of easy to publish uh, website where bloggers post information in a sequential order. They're the oldest and the most established form in social media. And in fact, a lot of the growth in the internet has actually happened because of blogs. They really foster open access to information. In, in healthcare, Paul Levy, who was the former president and CEO of the Beth Israel, was one of the earliest adopters of this in healthcare. And this is how he communicated about things that were happening in his hospital. This is how he, instead of having town hall meetings, he just wrote a blog and people uh, read it. You know, when you have multiple physicians and you can't really, I mean, how many of you have come to a CEO meeting here? It looks pretty empty, right? But through the blog, he's been able to reach people and get information out there in, in a very transparent and effective way. Uh, successful medical bloggers are excellent writers who are motivated to influence others and to share what they think and to influence practice. And, you know, here we have the fortune of having um, a couple of them. Uh, Kim Manning, who has written Reflections of a Grady Doc. If you haven't read his, her blog, you need to look at her blog. It's really fantastic. In, in Infectious Disease, we have one of our fellows, uh, BK Tijani, who writes the ID Doc, and uh, again, another fantastic uh, blog. And I can go on and on about other blogs that I like to look at, and they're very, very uh, effective, but really they're a great way of communication. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to Twitter. Twitter is a, it's a microblog uh, platform, and it's sort of, it's a dynamic and concise form of information exchange in social media. Twitter was originally limited to 140 characters, and then in November 2017 was increased to 280 characters. And they really, one of the way I think about a Twitter is sort of the telegram of the 21st century. Maybe young people have never seen a telegram, but this is how you communicate in the past. You send a telegram to somebody, well now the new form of the telegram is, is a Twitter, that's what it is. Um, <clears throat> Tweets are people who are on Twitter, and there's basically three broad categories of tweets. You can have a substantive tweet, a conversational tweet, or a hybrid tweet. You know, and I'll put a couple examples of them. You know, uh, substantive tweet is an independently understandable thoughts or comments, and I can read, but for example, read my review at Journal Watch or Paper and Jade's focusing on opioid use among persons living with HIV. Very short message, links to the paper. People can read this, and if they're interested, they can read the paper. You can have a conversational tweet in which you talk about ongoing events or things of personal interest to you. And then you can have a hybrid tweet. For example, here's one that I did about, you know, discussing a paper by, by Raj Gandhi at Emory Journal Club at Dr. Armstrong's house. So again, it's a very quick way to people to, you know, somebody seeing, oh, they're reading this paper at Journal Club. They're discussing this paper. And then by linking it, people can then, we have now done virtual journal clubs by doing this. <clears throat> So in healthcare, uh, there are about 140 reported uses of Twitter in medicine. There was a cute paper that talked about the 140 character ways to have 140 ways of using Twitter in medicine. Now you need to go to 280. But here's some of the most interesting applications. Some of the most interesting are in medical education. You can augment peer-to-peer -peer and instructor-to-student learning. 
You, as I said, you can do virtual journal clubs. They are very, very popular nowadays. Uh, you can do virtual rounds. Uh, our own department here has done the Emory micro rounds, our virtual rounds. Now we like to go to journal to to micro rounds, but if you don't go, you can actually see it on Twitter, and you can learn as you as if you were there by following micro rounds on Twitter. And there's one, for example, also Radiopedia. It's about a radiology uh, Twitter rounds in which the images are posted and people comment on them. And this is again another way, ex excellent way to enhance and discuss presentations at scientific meetings at conferences. Uh, it can be used for consultation. Uh, there's a there's a, a, a handle that I put there that is used for consultation uh, from Canada. But we wear a patient confidentiality and HIPAA issues, and that's why it's something that I would I would caution you about. And let's talk a little bit about that. So as a physician, you need to know what the HIPAA implications are. You need to know about professionalism. And you need to know what the guidelines are at your institution. Uh, the Federation of the Schools of, of, of Medical Colleges has developed a policy that I would encourage you to look at. It's very well done, and they really do a, a nice job about how do you get uh, social media into medicine? How do you protect the privacy and confidentiality of your patients? How do you avoid requests for online medical advice? How do you act with professionalism? How you be, you are forthcoming about your employment, your credentials, your conflict of interest? And again, you need to be aware that the information you post online is available to anyone and can be misconstructed. So let me give you a couple of examples of, of problems with social media for physicians. You know, so a urologist who's an astute clinician and a well-respected by his colleagues posted on Twitter a disrespect, uh, using disrespectful language when the United States Preventive Services Task Force came out with the recommendation in October of 2011 against routine PSA screening of healthy men for prostate cancer. This tweet went viral and was read by many of his patients, colleagues, fellow researchers, family, and friends. And many of his patients said, well, how come you're ordering this test if you don't believe in it? What was, you know, so I think you got to be careful about what you post if, if it goes against what you're practicing. Here's another a patient noted that disrespectful language in a physician blog when the physician expressed frustration towards another patient who had, he had seen in the ER multiple times for failing to monitor her blood glucose. The physician referred to the patient as lazy and ignorant. Um, a physician came across the profile of one of his patients online and on a dating website and invited her to go out on a date. Or resident films another resident inserting a chest tube and post it on, on YouTube so other residents can learn how to do the procedure. Yes, but the patient's face is clearly visible. So again, you know, those are the problems you can run into and you need to be very careful about HIPAA and, and social media. <clears throat> so Instagram, why should physicians, why would you be interested in Instagram? Well, you know, there's a paper that says, what are the eight reasons why Instagram is important in medicine? And it's a, humanize, it's a way to humanize what we do. You can talk about your job and, and by, with pictures, and you can see the Department of Medicine, the residents frequently have pictures of the residents having fun or enjoying themselves or, you know, or being up on the roof of Grady. Uh, it, is, it is very much used as a way, again, for women to communicate uh, in, in, in medicine. Uh, it's a great opportunity for mentorship. It's a space to nurture and... and uh, it's a, it's, it's a very good space for advocacy, and you know, it's a way to, to get, get skills to people and to provide motivation. And frequently, I think a very important use is that it, it normalizes mental health and failures that we have. <clears throat> so who here knows about figure one? So young people know about figure one. Older people don't know about figure one. So my first encounter with figure one was a medical student who I was meeting, and then the medical student said, so what do you think about figure one? And I said, that's really interesting because I'm not writing a paper with this person. Why would she be asking me about figure one? <laughs> and then she showed me what figure one was, and I became interested in figure one. So figure one is a Toronto-based online social networking service that was launched in May of 2013 for healthcare professionals to post and comment on medical in images. I think about it as Instagram for doctors. And uh, it has now over a million healthcare professionals who use this app. 13% uh, of medical professionals use this as smartphones. Uh, there are privacy concerns, but the app has now built even a way you can have patient consent uh, written into it, and there's easy ways to anonymize images. And, you know, it was very helpful, for example, during the MERS outbreak as a way to, to post images of chest x-rays and to really educate people about MERS and what was going on. And in fact, this is an image from, from figure one. And here's a, a general surgery resident posts an x-ray and says, you know, very clearly, a 32-year-old Female presents with seven days of fever and dyspnea. The patient is 28 uh, weeks pregnant. 
on presentation, fever is 39 degrees, as, as O2 sat is 80%, et cetera. You can keep on reading. But then people start commenting about what this could be, what the workup could be. And again, it's a wonderful way to really talk about a case and discuss a case uh, in, in online and an online platform in a safe environment. <clears throat> So let's move on uh, to Twitter and why is it important to academic medicine? Well, I, I find that, that a very useful thing for me is to, to, stay, up, to, to get, stay up with the literature, to look at, at what's happening, what journals are publishing. Uh, there's a lot of journals I, I don't necessarily look at, but I can look at them through Twitter and I can sign up to Twitter so I can see what they're publishing. And for what I do uh, as writing summaries for Journal Watch is very useful for me. I can, you know, all of a sudden notice a paper in Nature that we ought to cover that otherwise I would have not looked at on a regular basis. Uh, it's a good way to look at grant opportunities, and it's an excellent way to look at what science policy is doing, what organizations like Research America and others are doing, and what kind of things do we need to do to advocate uh, towards research. It is a great way to disseminate your research. So there is very good data that pe papers that are tweeted about more often accumulate citations. So in fact, if you're interested about your classic metrics, like citations, H-index, tweeting a paper actually increases the citations, and there's very good data on that. <clears throat> the volumes of tweets in the first week after publication actually correlates with a paper becoming a highly cited paper. And I'll give you an example of a paper that was done, a study that was done by one of our colleagues here, well, by multiple of our colleagues here, uh, Nadine uh, Rufal, led the study about, about a micro, about a patch for vaccination of influenza. This appeared in Lancet, was one of the top 10, uh, one, top 100 articles in Altmetric the year it was published, and that means that it had a lot of, of social media posts. That article has accumulated a lot of citations. So that clearly led to, to that paper being much more widely read than the paper would have otherwise been. Um, Again, it's a great way for participants in, who cannot attend to a meeting to become a virtual delegate. It is a, it's a way to seek information and ask questions about difficult cases or research problems. And it allows you to develop networks. And again, it's, it re gives you the opportunity to directly engage with non-scientific audiences. And that way you broaden your recognition as an expert. <clears throat> so how do you stay up to date with, the, with medicine? Well, it's not by reading up to date anymore. I'm sorry, but up to date is now the past. The way you stay up to date with medicine is actually by using Twitter. This is, how you, this is how the literature is evolving. This is how new things are being posted. This is how things are happening. And uh, in medical education, there's an increasing network of individuals using uh, Twitter, and their, their hashtag is, is, is hashtag MedEd, and they're using it for announcements, for helping students to study, for gathering resources, for sharing resources, for promoting activity, for networking. But there's a lot of uses for medical education on social media that this is where the, this is where the young people are. This is where we need to go meet them. <clears throat> there's a psycho free open access medical education. And this is a place where you find there's a collective of educational tools available for free. And there are blog posts, there are videos, there are podcasts, and they all get accumulated in this, in this FOE Med side, in this foam side. And the foam side really is a great way to, 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 to acquire information that you need about here's a video about this, that, and the other. And basically, this lives within Twitter. This is how you search it, and this is how you find the information. <clears throat> I mentioned to you Twitter journal clubs. There are a lot of them, but here's, you know, here's an article about the Geriatric Society, the Twitter journal club that they've done in geriatrics, and there's you know, the evolution of journal clubs from Mosler to Twitter. This is how journal clubs are happening, and virtual journal clubs are taken off and throughout specialties. <clears throat> so as I said, advocacy is a major tool, and this is how most of our societies are using uh, Twitter as an advocacy tool. It is really an, a very good way to get results out there. Yes, a lot of people use Facebook, but Twitter is really more powerful as it is immediately uh, uh, reaches reporters, politicians, decision makers, and other influencers. And in fact, Twitter has been called a great democratizer. You know, you can tweet and get a response from a member of Congress or a staffer almost immediately as a result of, of what you tweet on it. Uh, and Twitter uh, is immediate. It forges relationships, it amplifies your messages, and it gets results. And I'll give you an example uh, when, you know, when a, a tree fell in my house and there was a, uh, a, a news reporter on it, I took that clip from the, from the news report in WSB, I put it on Twitter, I tagged my insurance company, 
Uh, by the time the adjuster came over, he said, don't worry, Dr. Del Rio, we will take care of you. Even the president of the company has seen your tweet. <laughs> so again, I would have never been able to reach the president of the company, but through Twitter, I was able to have the president of the company take a look at my tweet and say, we need to take care of this person. <laughs> and this is what I was telling you. This is the paper. Uh, this is the number of citations and how a number of citations goes up as, as tweet goes, as, as social media impact of a paper goes up. And you can say, well, this paper was going to go up anyway. Well, it really isn't. I mean, really, by putting it on social media, it goes up a lot faster. The number of citations go up a lot faster. <clears throat> so I think now when you go out for your discussion with your chair, division director, you know, they'll say, you know, this is great. You're doing very well in discoveries. You're saving lives. You're improving the world. But is your research making barely any impact on social media? What's wrong with you? And I think that's, you know, that's what our universities are looking for. That's what the, the communications department nowadays is not about getting a press release. It's about getting a message in social media. This is how they get the information out. This is how they let people know what's happening within their walls. <clears throat> so I asked people, uh, people that are influencers on Twitter that I, I said I was, I'm talking to my colleagues. What, what should I tell them about, about why they need to be on Twitter? And uh, Kelly Kanout, who's an I, uh, ID and critical care specialist at Nebraska, she said, there are so many great reasons to be on social media. It can easily be overwhelming, but connecting to experts, networking, learning, collaborating, helping combat misinformation, promoting your research, and so on. Knowing the Emory social media policy to address potential risks is, is helpful for those concerned. Jonathan Zellman said, uh, uh, though there is danger, uh, in spread of misinformation in the setting of rapid evolving outbreaks, social media can educate and empower doctors. Uh, Marilyn McKay, for example, has done a yeoman work uh, compiling up-to-date case numbers and details of emerging epidemics like Ebola or MERS when this outbreak is happening. In fact, if I need to find out what's happening with the current Ebola outbreak in the DRC, this is where I go. I go to Twitter to find the information. By the time you get into the WHO and the CC, CDC website, is way too late. So this is where reports are going. This is where people are working now in, in, in public health. Uh, Jamal Shaham, who's at Hopkins, says uh, something, for example, the story of how the annals opinion piece on guns exploded into the national consciousness with this is our lane became a rallying cry. I think this, this became a big way in which this positions embrace this because of social media. Now, uh, this is our lane became uh, a hashtag used by many organizations to talk about why we as physicians are against uh, gun violence. <clears throat> uh, Joe Cooper, you know, he's at the University of Washington. He told, talks about the role of medical education and the use of board style questions. And he there is a, 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 hash, a uh, Twitter handle here that he uses, for instance, in which re regularly he posts board like questions. So people can, you know, take their board like questions and, tra and train for the boards as they're doing this. Uh, Nico Cortez, who's actually an ID fellow, says, you know, tell them about ID Farm on Twitter. This is how I learn about antibiotics. This is how I go deeper than just what I learn in daily rounds. Uh, Paul Sachs, who's at the Brigham, uh, mentioned something that was really fantastic. When the, the authors of the Marino trial, this was a major trial published in New England Journal of Medicine, well, the authors actually engaged with readers, readers on Twitter to clarify to clarify, study, uh, answer questions, et cetera. So people on Twitter were, were working with the authors and asking questions about the study after it had been published, and the authors were engaging with, with readers on Twitter and answering uh, uh, questions that they had on their paper. Uh, Kim Barrett, who is at, at UCSD, he says, I would add the opportunity to network with people you may never have connected otherwise, but you meet in, in, and, and not, not even meet in real life. I mean, you know, Eric Topol, who I don't know, frequently engages with me in Twitter, and we communicate about different topics that way. Uh, Ryan Starr says, I would also recommend Journal Club, for example, this is a hospital medicine, uh, journal, uh, journal hospital medicine chat. And, uh, and again, Kelly says, I have ended up with publications and other invitations. It's a great way to meet the professor when you may not have the opportunity at a national conference or even at Grand Rounds to meet the person. So a lot of ways in which people are now using social media to engage academically. Okay, so nuts and bolts, how do you get started? Well, first of all, I think it's important that you know your, your organization uh, uh, social media guidelines and, and understand what they are. Uh, but after that, what you do is you go to, to, to Twitter, you set up an account, it's really easy to do that. You can do it from, the, you can download the app and do it directly from the app. You create a professional name, uh, you add a short bio and text, and you upload a professional photo, and those are, and you're done, you're ready to go. And 
this is what my screen looks like. And, you know, so you can see there's a picture here that says Emery. There's my picture. It talks about who I am and, and the kinds of things I'm going to be posting about. And I make it very clear that if I retweet something that's not an endorsement, it has a link to my website, and it tells me how many people are following me and how many people I'm following. And uh, one of the concerns that people f frequently have is that it's, it is overwhelming, as Kelly said. And sometimes stepping into Twitter, it feels like you know, you're going down a rapid, uh, the rapids and you're being thrown in the one direction on the other. What do you tweet about? What do, what do I show up in my Twitter page? Uh, how am I missing something? Uh, what, what do I do? And I think it's really important that you decide uh, to think about Twitter as you would think about email or other things. There are certain things, times when you use it, you need to decide when you're going to look at it, when you're not going to look at it, and you need to more, more importantly decide what things you want to get engaged with and what are the things you're going to be passionate about and what are the things you're going to be using it for. <clears throat> and that may change depending on the day or depending on the time of the year. Uh, so some basic terminology. A tweet, again, it's 140 or 280 character, including spaces. It's a dynamic text message that will be sent instantly to all the followers in real time. Uh, and again, when you write it, think about how it really helps you to, 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 to compress what you're trying to say, to limit your, your ideas, to be really specific about what you're trying to say. A feed is a stream of tweets that you can see from your homepage. And again, people are maybe posting on similar issues. Uh, your retweeting is when you take a tweet from somebody and you forward it to others. So somebody that you read their tweets has a tweet, you like it, and you can show a like, and then, but you can also then send to others in your network. It amplifies the reach of somebody's tweet. And I'll have, for example, frequently I'll have, I don't know, um, people here in communications, let's say the, when, when Emory became a, uh, a comprehensive cancer center, I had the Winship people send me, hey, we just tweeted this and we tagged you. Could you please retweet it so it reaches out to your network? And this is a way to amplify the message that the organization has. Uh, a hashtag is a way to bring some order to tweets. And so, for example, you can use a hashtag, you know, end dates 2020. There was a hashtag when Trump wanted to cut the funding for the Fogarty International Center. There was a hashtag save Fogarty that, again, went to many members of Congress trying to tell them the importance of the Fogarty International Center. And that really was very important in, in keeping the funding for, for Fogarty. And, uh, and again, there's, there's different ways to get your message out. So uh, some basic terminology, uh, trending. This is a term to describe when a topic or hashtag is used often and it becomes very popular. So you can look in, in Twitter page and see what's trending at that moment and, and whether you want to get engaged or not in whatever's trending. And this may be you know, uh, something related to politics or something related to, uh, to, to the arts or something related. I mean, you know, when, the, when the second patient that had been cured for HIV was, uh, was presented, that became something that was trending. Uh, a favorite is an indication that you like a specific tweet. And this is done, again, by, by tapping on a star or a little heart, and the author is notified that you like the tweet. To follow is to subscribe to somebody's uh, Twitter account. And again, you can always unfollow somebody. You just tap in the button again, and, you, and, and that disappears it. Uh, Twitter has a, a feature called DM, direct messaging, that is a bit like email. It's another, a way to send a private message to somebody. So let's suppose I'm following somebody on Twitter, but I need to I would like to get them a private message. You don't need to put it on Twitter for everybody to see. You can, through direct message, and send them a specific email direct message to them that they can respond to in, in, in a personal way. So you can use the same platform to do something similar to email. And, uh, and a hat trip is just to acknowledge uh, someone or to credit a different tweet account. So this is how uh, we think about how we communicate. You, know, you can either be preaching to the choir here we are scientists, and here we're communicating to other people. Or you can be out there, you can be singing from the rooftop, and here you are as a scientist, and you're reaching the media, you can reach the, the public, and you eventually go on to reach decision makers. So this is where we eventually want to be. And how do you get there? Well, you know, the, the more followers you have, the more likely that's going to be a, uh, the case. And, uh, and in general, when you look at people in science or in academia, uh, about 55% of people that are your followers are actually not scientists or academics. Um, and the, the, the magic number is 1,000. When you get past 1,000 followers, this is when you start having a very diverse audience. This is when you go beyond your circle of influence. This is when you start reaching you know, uh, uh, media uh, 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 and eventually decision makers. This is how the, number, the more 
followers you have, the more likely you are to start reaching those numbers. And as I said, the sort of the, the magic number is about a thousand. <clears throat> so a couple more uh, 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 tips: have personality in your tweets. Use a, hum a human voice. Uh, use simple words, you know, don't use professional jargon, just make it real simple because it's going to be read by professional people, but it's also going to be read by the media, it's going to be read by consumers, it's going to be read by others who may not understand if you use very professional uh, language. Use images, videos, or, or links to enhance what you're trying to say. Tag or mention others, you know, again, if I have a message that I want, uh, you know, that it's, I know is it's, it's something of interest to somebody else, I, I like to tag them. Uh, retweet others. Uh, they are more likely to be inclined to follow you. Share an article with a specific expertise and offer your comment. You know, an article just came out on, on JAMA that you read and you have an opinion about it. Well, you know, tag the article, but not only just post the article, post your opinion about the article. Set, you know, what is it, why is this important? Why is this somebody people should read? Uh, take extra time to find relevant hashtags to use with your message. Uh, use appropriate punctuation. Uh, and be professional. I think it's really important that, that you remember that any tweet will be captured for eternity. And you can, you can schedule when, uh, when you send tweets, and scheduled tweets uh, can be done when they're most likely to be read. And in fact, early morning hours is the time that most, uh, most tweets are read. Uh, evening and late hours are, are, are a lot of people are with this when they're looking at their tweets or they're doing favorites. And other times there has an inverse relationship. So in fact, there are apps out there that you can use to schedule when your tweets go out <clears throat> at the most impactful hours. <clears throat> okay, Twitter events and Twitter chats. A Twitter chat is a, it's a live Twitter event centered on a specific topic and organized using a predetermined hashtag and time frame. Attendings are invited in advance to participate in the chat, which is usually moderated by individual organization. And tweets, and, and, and this chat's typically uh, have four or five questions. And why should you participate? Well, because they enhance your voice, they demonstrate expertise, they allow you to engage with others, et cetera. Uh, one that, uh, I don't know if I have it here, no. One that I, for example, seen, there are a couple of, ones, well, there's a woman in medicine uh, Twitter chat that occurs san Sunday at 9 p.m. and has a bunch of people, and there are all sorts of questions, like how do you get promoted? What kinds of things do you need to do? What do you think about having male uh, mentors? Uh, how do you engage with, what do we do about this? It's really a great way to look at information, and people are just sharing information and mentoring others through, through Twitter. <clears throat> Uh, live tweeting is when you attend an event, a conference, or a scientific presentation in real time and you capture quotes or paraphrase messages. You maybe take a look at the slides and you put them up there. And this is a, a great way to, why would you do this? Well, you know, you network with others, you demonstrate your expertise, you increase your followers and you influence, and you share resources, as I said, with others that couldn't be at a meeting. And I'll give you an example. There's a big conference for those of us in, in HIV called CROI, the Conference of Retrovirus and Opportunistic Infections. And here I'm using, there's two uh, platforms. One is Simplor and one is, is NodeGraph. Simplor used, look at the hashtag for the meeting. Hashtag for the meeting was hashtag CROI2019. And I was able to go to these two platforms and say, well, you know, they were, this is the number of tweets that were out there, the, the number of impressions, the number of tweets. And here's the people that had the most, the most impressions of sort of who were the top influencers of the meeting. And, but you can also do a, this is a graph and how this is a network analysis of how people were tweeting around the meeting. So for example, here in the, meeting, in the middle is, this is when the patient that was the second case of cured HIV, and these are all the tweets that happened around it. And you can again, follow how people were communicating with each other, both inside and outside the meeting, and, and reading the information. And this is how a lot of the press that wasn't at the meeting is able to get the information they want. <laughs> so a couple of final thoughts about social media. Uh, I cannot stress enough that you need, it's important to maintain professionalism at all times. Again, know your institutional policies and, uh, and, and think about anything you post as no different than something that is gonna be published in the newspaper. Ask yourself, is this something that I wouldn't mind reading in the newspaper the next day? Uh, post a disclaimer that states information is not an endorsement. As I said, you know, it's nice to say, you know, if I retweet you, this is not that I'm endorsing you. Uh, be nicer online than when you are, are uh, offline. I think it's really important that you, it's, that you don't engage in, in, in Twitter battles with people. It's not, 
not appropriate and is not correct. Uh, again, be authentic, have fun, don't be afraid. It's really important to be genuine. A ask for help. You know, as you start doing it, uh, at, you know, look at the uh, what others are doing, mimic their social media uh, actions. And it's really important to, to uh, identify an issue, say something interesting, foster personal relationship, and again, take action. This is a great way to get engaged in something. When you say, you know, I'm sick and tired of, you know, the funding for NIH being cut. Well, this is a good way for you to show your voice and say, we need to do something about the NIH funding or we need to do something about Medicaid expansion. I mean, this is a wonderful way to communicate that you're really interested in having the governor expand Medicaid. Just get out on Twitter and say so. He will be reading it. His staff will be reading it. <clears throat> uh, what are strategies to help you maximize the benefit and minimize the risk? I think being intentional is very important. You know, social media allows you to reach both intended and unintended audiences. And you need to think about every post as if you were speaking to someone sitting right next to you. Because people who, I mean, you will know when somebody's following you, but you will be surprised about the people that all of a sudden sign up and follow you. I mean, I can tell you when, you know, Scaramucci all of a sudden started following me. You know, you realize that some people are going to follow you on the entire spectrum of the political spectrum, and, and they're going to be looking at what you say. I think build, fill this, build a strong network. The key to social media is really being having the right people that you're following. Uh, I think let the haters, you know, hate and, and take the high road. There's really no point of no role that I see for hate in social media, and and I think it's very important to stay clear of the ugly side of social media. There is, I mean, I can tell you, for example, in the vaccine world, there's a lot of of things happening on social media with anti-vaxxers, and I think it's really important that you stay on message. You don't engage about you are wrong, but really get your message out, the correct message. Be be respectful, but get the information, get the right information out. There's no reason to get engaged in 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 a fight. And, and again, be charitable. You know, remember that posts would last forever. <clears throat> um, so I'll end by talking about some of the accounts to follow. Obviously, if you get on Twitter, follow the Department of Medicine, uh, follow the School of Medicine. Here are a couple of other Twitter accounts to follow. Uh, the, the Health Sciences Communications Office has actually put together a list of about 80 accounts in, em in, 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 uh, in Emory. And again, just by clicking on that, once you get into Twitter, it's probably not going to let me because I'm not, you know, I need to sign up to Twitter. But here's all the different organizations that Emory has and that you can get into. Uh, here's some Emory School of Medicine faculty accounts worth following on Twitter. Uh, some of them are here in the department, like you know, Wendy or Ben Tank Precha or Colleen Kraft. But others are not in the department. You know, Kathy Glass, for example, or Sagar Loniel or others. Rich Dursak, for example, in radiology, is very involved with Medicare and Medicaid issues. He knows a lot about health policy. It's a really good person to, to, to follow and read. And again, uh, the communications people in, in health sciences have put together a list of about 250 Emory doctors. And just by getting going here, you have all the list of Emory doctors that you can look down and see here's Kim Manning, see? So live tweeting. So so here's Jessica. So again, everything that comes from Emory is captured automatically into this. Uh, what other accounts to follow? Well, you know, uh, news organizations, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, etc. Uh, health news, you know, like for example, Kaiser Family Foundation or or Health Affairs, uh, and journals, you know, as I said, New England, JAMA, Lancet, Annals. The most of the big journals are now science uh, are having their Twitter accounts, and this is how they're disseminating a lot of their information. Here's a couple other people outside of Emory that I consider sort of influencers or advocates uh, worth following, <clears throat> and uh, and this is there's a, there's a hashtag uh, there's a, a handle called social media docs, and there's a couple of hashtags that are for physicians, you know, for example, this, this hashtag I mentioned, women in medicine, or Twitter med ed, or, or med Twitter. And, uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, Paul Sufka, who, uh, who actually just gave, on Monday, he gave grand rounds on social media at the Department of Medicine at University of, of, of Minnesota. He actually posted on, 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 on Twitter that he was looking for, uh, for accounts in, across different specialties. He wanted three or four cardiologists, pulmonologists, ICU people that should be followed. And he created a list that if you go to his Twitter account, you can find all the Twitters of all the different people across the specialties that were, he considered the, the top influencers. You can actually also see his grand rounds uh, on social media. So a couple of concluding thought, thoughts. I think academic medicine uh, is slowly harnessing the, the power of social media for networking, for professional development, for education, and for dissemination of information. 
Twitter is a social media of choice for academic medicine. Millennial learners have embraced social media and we need to meet them there. I think it's really important that we realize this is how we're getting to residents, to, to medical students. This is a great way to get information. And I would say that the choice to engage with or to embrace social media is really yours. But if you don't, you will find that in the near future, you will have a lot of challenge sharing information, growing professional networks, and staying on top of the relevant literature. So it's really up to you, but this is a little bit like the EMR. You know, if you don't embrace it, eventually you will, you, will, you will fade away. You just have to say, this is something I need to get into because this is how people are going to communicate. And as Wendy said, you know, I've been doing this since uh, 2011. And in fact, HIVMA gave me, when I left HIVMA board, uh, tweeting for, uh, for science and public health because that's what I do and that's what I like to be known for. And with that, I want to just acknowledge, you know, Kelly, Gerald, uh, Paul, and Wendy uh, for reviewing their slides, for giving me suggestions, and for helping with this Grand Rounds. And with that, I'll leave a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, for that uh, excellent overview. Uh, how much time do you spend a day <laughs> on Twitter? Uh, two questions, though, serious ones. Uh, Doximity. You didn't mention doximity. Would you kind of comment on the role, your, your impression of doximity as a social media tool? Um, and then to follow up a little bit more, what is, the, what is your thinking or your sense of patient care as it relates to social media? So those are very good questions. Number one, uh, you know, I sometimes when I have nothing to do, I'm waiting for something to happen. I may be in social media, but you know, it's really important that sometimes you just, just watch your time. And again, what, how much you spend is really up to you. You decide how much you want to spend and where you want to do it. As far as Doximity, I think Doximity is a useful resource. It's primarily, it's a little bit like, a, a bit like LinkedIn in the sense that you can create a network of individuals of, of, an, of an address book of people that you want to know about. I think the importance of Doximity is it frequently is being used by organizations to look at, you know, it's being used for places like for voting for the best physicians or voting for the best specialties at a place. US News and World Reports frequently looks at it. So being engaged in Doximity allows you to put your vote out. And, and that's, I think, the major use I have in Doximity is that a lot of organizations make sure all their physicians are in Doximity and they're voting for their hospital because that's how they get their US News and World Report rankings up. So organizations that are very savvy on how they use social media do much better in, in rankings than others that don't. Uh, and, and finally about you know, patient care, I think this is a, a really uh, tricky issue. I think it's a good way to ask for advice. I think it's a good way to look at, 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 at recommendations. Uh, I can think about, for example, a couple of ones that I've seen recently, somebody posting an antibiogram of a multi-drug resistant organism and saying, you know, I have this patient in the ICU with this organism in the blood. What antibiotic combination would you suggest? And several experts suggested, well, you know, how about this and that? And then you hear the follow-up, what, what they did and what happened. I think the risk, of course, is always that, you know, let's suppose that a family member is, is, is following you on Twitter and finds you on, on Twitter because it's very easy to find somebody to follow. And then that family member says, oh, you know, they posted about my, my father or my relative on social media and they're discussing the antibiotic this way. I think you need to, to in that sense, be, be clear and communicate with the family that you, you're going to be doing this, because otherwise they will, you know, they will find it. And, and you, again, you need to be careful about the kind of comments. Somebody, somebody may say, you know, the post may be, oh, this person has an organism that is going to die. Well, that, you don't want the family to learn about it that way. So I think you need to be very careful about what you post and how you post it and think about, again, you, 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 would, be, you would be communicating with others in front of the family by, do, by putting it in social media. I think about... Uh, as far as giving advice to patients on social media, I think it's something that most of us will be really hesitant about and something that I would, I would uh, caution about not doing because most of the time the people asking for advice are people that you don't even know, you haven't seen, and, and that would be, I think, uh, a, a very dangerous thing to do. I have a couple off-site questions. Um, I think both of these are from Grady. One of them um, most directly related to your talk. How do you combat fake data that researchers might be propagating out there? Well, you know, I mean, fake, fake data is, is a problem in social media, and it's, you know, fake, fake misinformation, whether you're talking about, you know, 
you know, just put the example of anti-vacciners, or you can go on and on. I think you counteract it by, by giving the facts. I think you counteract it by stressing the facts. I don't think you, you engage with them, but I think you need to be very clear about what the reality is and, and, and what, yeah, you know, I'll give you an example. You know, when I think it was the governor of Missouri said, you know, he didn't vaccinate his kids against uh, chicken pox. He just exposed all of them to chicken pox because he doesn't think the vaccine is safe. Well, I think several people that actually care about vaccines, like Saad Omer, posted, you know, some data on the real efficacy of the of the varicella zoster vaccine and the the potential consequences of not being vaccinated and the mortality associated with with, with varicella. Thank you. Um, and then maybe a slight tangent. What do you think about the role of social media to attract students, residents to different programs around the country as like a recruitment tool? It's a wonderful recruitment tool. It's a great way to show videos, to show images of, you know, happy residents or residents. I mean, I see it all the time, the Department of Medicine posting residents, you know, out and, you know, a, a having dinner or having uh, doing something socially. I think it's a wonderful recruitment tool. I can tell you it's also a wonderful uh, 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 notoriety tool. You know, the, the, uh, the two colleagues of ours who work at University of Nebraska and the ID department, I mean, University of Nebraska ID division is not a top division. And through social media, they have become a known ID division very rapidly, and people are paying attention to them. And they're all of a sudden, they weren't recruiting fellows. All of a sudden, they're recruiting fantastic fellows because of the presence of social media. Nothing else has changed. So I think it's a wonderful recruitment tool. Yeah, programs that are not using you know, social media for recruitment tools will be in the losing end. Great. Uh, Thank you very much, Carlos. That was excellent. Appreciate it. <laughs>